Here's the speedometer for my Vespa V90. I decided to do an autopsy on it. Uh, the speedometer was inoperable when I picked up the scooter, um, and I could tell because the needle was all was pretty much pegged at, I think it was set not pegged, but it was set to about 20 miles an hour, and I could see that the uh, the dial face was faded, almost to be completely illegible, um, and uh, there are little bits of material visible on the uh, inside of the uh, lens, so. I decided I'm going to do a, a little autopsy and see what went wrong. So, as soon as I cracked it open, I pretty much figured out what happened. Now, this unit is sealed shut with solder, and I ended up, I, I uh, cracked the solder by deforming the, uh, the case just a little bit, and then I pried it off with uh, a small screwdriver and a pair of pliers. I could have uh, used a torch to melt it, but that could have... Um, da damaged it even more. When I pulled the cap off, I looked inside and I see all these little magnetic filings. So I'm like, ah, I see what happened. So let me explain. Normally, a speedometer works like this. You have, you have two components. Now this actually applies to automobiles, motorcycles, bicycles, anything with an analog mechanical speedometer. The electronic speedometers work through servo motors, I believe. Um, so that's completely different. In this case, you have a driven, a driven shaft and a, driv a drive shaft and a driven shaft. The drive shaft connects directly to the speedometer cable, which goes down to the front wheel, and that rotates whenever the wheel is spinning. This is a mag basically a spinning magnet, is what it really is. It's a rotating magnet, and it is actually uh, mounted into a um, a cup that is made of a, a ferrous material like steel. It has to be... Um, it has to have some attraction to magnets to work. And that is attached to a, dri a driven shaft with the speedometer needle mounted to it. You can actually see that shaft. It's just right in front of the odometer. And it goes through the dial face and has a needle attached to it. Now, normally, if, if it was just that simple, if you spun this magnet, it would actually peg the speedometer every single time. No matter how fast it was moving, that speedometer would just peg to its maximum reading. So to prevent that from happening, the manufacturers installed what's called a counter spring, or a clock spring. That clock spring provides a counter-rotating force that could be overcome based on the speed of the drive shaft. Plain English, the faster this magnet spins, the more magnetic resistance or field, the higher the magnetic field is created, which provides more torsion on that steel cup. So the faster it spins, the more power it applies and the more it can overcome the spring to reach an ever higher reading. Consequently, the odometer is driven directly off this shaft the drive shaft. That way the odometer is you know, unaffected by the vehicle speed. You can actually see this visualized right here. You've got the odometer drive wheel or drive shaft here, which is a uh, has a little worm gear on the end and a uh, it's driven off of another worm gear which is driven off the drive shaft. And the head bone connects to the foot bone, vice versa. So let's tear it down even further, and we'll see what really happened. To do that, I'm going to need to whip out some pliers, and I'm going to have to twist these two tabs, straighten them out. I might need a smaller pair of pliers. Yeah, I think so. Or I could use a brute force attack. Or a pair of screwdrivers. That might work. Maybe I'll get some uh, smaller needle nose pliers. So essentially what happened here, and I'm not sure if I mentioned it earlier, but the magnet, or the driven wheel, exploded. 
and uh, sent shards of magnetic dust everywhere, which caused the outer cup to lock with the inner cup. And we now have a situation where the needle spins no matter how fast the uh, drive shaft is, is uh, manipulated. And if you look inside here, you can see that once that occurred, it applied too much force to the uh, to the needle itself to the needle shaft, wrapped the clock spring around itself, along and actually tore the mount for the clock spring off completely, and made a huge disaster of a mess. So we're now going to pull it apart as much as we can and do some investigating. I that's my goal. I want to see if I can't pry this. There we go. I straightened out the, uh, the tab so I can do this. Fortunately, a replacement speedometer for this thing is easy to come by and uh, won't be difficult at all. Wow! Did not expect that. Um, so this is what I'm finding. Look at that. It just completely exploded. The, uh, th ooh, I think I know why. So this is the, this piece right here that we're looking at. This is the magnet. It, ha it basically, it's a, um, a round magnet attached or pressed onto a steel core. And as you can see, that magnet has disintegrated. And I think I know why. I think you guys are going to like this. This is a pretty good theory. I'm proud of it. So here's what I think happened. Here's what I think happened. Of course, I'm going to try to pull this out a little more and, and get a better look at it, but... Let me just do that. There we go. Oh, okay. Alright, so I got this washer off. Now this is what it looks like with that washer removed. Let me see. Let's get this out of here. Look at that. I'm about ready to lift the whole mechanism completely apart here. So you can get a better visual. Like I said, automotive and uh, motorcycle speedometers are very similar in construction and uh, they work on the same principles so here we, this is this is interesting now that magnet is composed of a core that appears to be a centered metal or plastic that's interesting let's pick it up well, it is magnetic, so it is metal. It looks like it's made of bronze, or like a centered bronze, or, uh, yeah, centered bronze is what I'm thinking. It's a very, um, a very, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? A very loose composition. It's not very dense. So let me get down to why I think this occurred. Now, this scooter is 51 years old. Here's my theory. The magnet was originally made much like a refrigerator magnet, like this one here. Refrigerator magnets are actually made from a composition of materials. They're made from um, iron particles, which are magnetized, molded into a plastic-like material. And over time, here's my theory, it's a wild one. That plastic substrate or binder broke down. And over time, it started to dis disintegrate. And once it started to disintegrate, little bits and pieces of it got lodged between whatever didn't fall apart and what did fall apart <laughs> and uh, it just turned into like a blender which eventually pulverized that magnet into oblivion 
And that's what happened. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Much like this uh, magnet sticking to this ring. Which is too bad, because an otherwise perfectly good speedometer, which may have some fading on the uh, dial, has become utterly worthless. And you can see, it was like that for quite some time, because... You can see all the wear on this uh, on this wheel here. It, it, it was driven like this. So it didn't happen, you know, uh, while it was sitting in storage or anything. It, it was driven this way. Now, you might be thinking, well, how does that affect the odometer? Like, is it really reading 6299? Yes, it is. Because the odometer is driven off of a, uh, a jack shaft, which is completely unrelated to the spinning magnet. As long as this shaft was spinning, which it likely was, that jack shaft was also spinning. So while the odometer, or the speedometer, would be completely useless, the odometer would still be doing its job. And I have every reason to believe so, and no reason to believe otherwise. So I'm going to pull it apart even further, and we're going to see what that all looks like. And maybe it's all, maybe it's shredded too, because it would mix, you know, okay. It's actually in pretty good shape. The uh, jack shaft is um, still meshing with that worm gear on the uh, dr on the uh, drive shaft, and it was still meshing with the other shaft as well. So sixty two ninety nine is a believable and legitimate reading, in my humble opinion. Now let's see how that odometer works. Normally you don't get a chance to do this, but in this instance, uh, we're gonna we're gonna see. So, the odometer is driven by this uh, tenth mile gear, and every time that gear rotates completely, it rotates this little counter wheel, or um, how can I how can I call that a a counter gear? And once that gear rotates, boom, oh, we're going the other, the wrong direction. Okay, it's got to go this way. When that gear rotates, which it, it, it only meshes with the tenth wheel, once a revolution, boom. Once it rotates, you can see that, it moves the, uh, the next wheel over one numeral. Watch that again. Can you see it? Probably not. Okay. Same thing happens with this wheel. Once this wheel makes a complete revolution, it rotates this uh, counter gear, or um, spur gear. <coughs> I don't know what to call it, really. I, I'm not an engineer. But once that rotates, it rotates the number next to it, and so on and so forth. Eventually, it maxes out at 9999999. Okay. And that's how those work. Pretty damn simple when you think about it. Pretty damn simple. So this speedometer is toast. Absolutely beyond repair. Um, yeah, the face is destroyed. That's my fault. But yeah, it was completely faded. I think it had red numerals. So the one I buy to replace it should also have red numerals. Um, we're going to just throw this all in the garbage where it belongs not really useful to anyone. I may save this as a reference. Um, yeah, I'm going to probably do that. Just save it as a reference so I know what the old speedometer... No, you know what? I, I know what it is. It's 6300. That's what it said. So that's what I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to just call it. 6300, and I'm going to just make sure to make a note of that when I install the new one. And there you go. That is, uh... Now, this, um... This lens is made of real glass. Which is pretty cool. How many motorcycles today have a glass speedometer lens? It's amazing. You just don't see that every day. On antique ones, yes. But new ones, you don't see that. 
new ones they're all about the plastics they're cheaper to make and guess what they have a shelf life <laughs> so there you go and we're gonna put these away thanks for watching before I forget you probably noticed that there were no provisions for any lighting in that speedometer assembly. And that is true. That speedometer has no backlighting whatsoever. None. Zilch. Not a single thing. No, no way to light up. So, it's interesting because I've driven mopeds from the 70s that have had backlit speedometers. A moped is the lowest form of vehicle anyone can ever buy. One step above a bicycle. And even they have backlit speedometers. Which is really strange because you just you wouldn't think you wouldn't think that the speedometer would not have a backlight. I mean, who would think that? Right? Truth is, it was definitely an option back in those days. Um, speedometers, believe it or not, were also an option. They were not standard equipment on certain Vespa models. Um, as a matter of fact, on the Allstate, the cheapest of the Allstate motor scooters did not have speedometers at all. Allstates were made by um, Vespa or Piaggio for Sears, and they were um, essentially uh, low-cost versions of uh, Vespa 125s. The, um, the Vespa 90s and the Vespa 50s sold in Europe, the speedometer was a, was a factory option or a dealer installable option. Um, so, you know, the fact that they don't have backlighting is really no surprise when you think of it that way. Okay, I should sum it up in a nutshell. All right, the day is now February 13th, 2016. The beginning part of this video was filmed on December 10th. Since then, um, I have replaced my camera, so my audio is a little different. So what we're looking at right now is the headset for the 1964 Vespa. Now, the speedometer was beyond all hope of ever being repaired. Um, I didn't ever really intend on fixing it, uh, because parts are not available for those. They really, unfortunately, the only solution is to, to replace it with a used or a reproduction speedometer. I don't think there are any new old stock ones left on planet Earth. <laughs> but I was able to secure a replacement. Uh, this one I ordered from England, actually. Now, the one that I originally ordered on December 10th when I shot that video, the first part of this video, never came. But the seller was able to refund my money. It was like 25 bucks or so, which I immediately reapplied towards uh, a different one. Now, this one I ordered from an English seller uh, because getting one in miles per hour is kind of difficult. When you go searching for a Vespa small frame speedometer, I want to say 99% of the ones you're going to find are in kilometers. So finding one that measures in miles is, um, is not an easy undertaking. I only found two sellers that had them. One of them was from India, one of them was from England. And the Indian guy, unfortunately, uh, I don't think it's his fault, I think it was either lost in shipping or held up in customs, but I, it just never showed up. So anyway, this one is uh, from England. And uh, one of the few countries in the world that's, that actually uses miles to measure distance on automobiles. Uh, so naturally, they're one of the few places that would have one of these. And fortunately for me, I was able to find one. <laughs> so uh, this is the replacement speedometer. This is um, a reproduction. This is not an original uh, Veglia Borletti. Uh, this is probably made in India, actually. I, I bet you... I'm 99% sure. No, I'm 100% sure that this was made in India. Now, these come in a variety of different uh, flavors. Um, you'll find that some of them actually have black lettering. Some of them have the older Piaggio Shield uh, logo. This is, what, this is one that has the hexagonal logo. 
which is um, one, two, three, four, five. Yeah, six sides. <laughs> anyway, the hexagonal logo is um, is from later model years and not period correct for '64. It would have had the shield logo, but it's as good as I'm going to get. Um, unlike the original, this one has a plastic crystal. And I believe the original one was a flat crystal. It didn't have a dome shape to it. But it still looks like a pretty high quality reproduction. I mean, it'll do the job. Um, I mean, let's face it, the, the accuracy of this speedometer isn't that critical. Here's why. The maximum speed on this scooter is about 45 miles an hour. That's at full throttle. And the average cruising speed in my area is about 45 miles an hour so if I'm running wide open I'm okay I'm not speeding well I am technically but I probably won't get busted for it um, now the accuracy of the odometer is in question too I mean you gotta realize this is a reproduction so you know it may not be calibrated properly it may have um, it may not last I don't know all I really needed to do is to it's really just there for looks I mean Let's face it, it doesn't tell me anything else. It just tells me speed and distance traveled. Um, as long as it fits in this hole, and it does, then it uh, pretty much wins. <laughs> as long as it fits, it wins. And, um, you know, again, this is not going to be my daily driver. This is a show bike. This is a, um, a, re a restoration as close as possible to original that I can come up with. And um, I'm not expecting... Uh, you know, I'm not expecting this thing to wind up on the auction block at Barrett-Jackson. Uh, I just need it to look as close to original as possible. Um, I wanted to keep the original speedometer, um, but I got curious and I wanted to take it apart and see why it failed, and that's just, you know, that's just what I do. Probably shouldn't have done that, but it's not like I can go back and change it, you know what I'm saying? Not like I can go back and put it back together again. Because as soon as I went to go pull the lid off, it just, the whole dial just shattered on it. So I'm like, yeah, shit. So. And you can't get a new dial for that one. Not in, not in miles. <laughs> Unless you buy a reproduction, tear it apart, and start combobulating. But not only that, the, uh, the magnet was, um, was destroyed. So if I hooked it up to the speedometer cable, it would just make a lot of noise. Um, so it had to go. But there we go. We got a re replacement reproduction speedometer as close to factory as I could find. And uh, I think it'll be okay. Now, as for the rest of this, um, I actually am going to be sending this off to a place that uses glass beating or glass um, sandblasting, glass blasting. And they're going to strip off all the paint and hopefully smoothen out some of the corrosion. And then it's going to go to a... Um, to a painter where it'll be painted. Uh, one thing I want to point out on this scooter is that it has very low miles on it. And one of the issues I've found or that I've read about on these older Vespas is as they wear out, as they get old, um, the, uh, the handlebars, now this one is a gear selector and this side is a throttle, they start to loosen up in, in their mounts because they basically just slip into these um, machined openings and uh, those machined openings can wear out just like anything else. So on an older bike with more miles you're gonna find that the handlebars are are just pr chronically loose. One of the um, biggest what, what, one of the uh, how can I put this if you buy a Vespa that's been restored in Vietnam, knowingly or otherwise, um, they are generally extremely high mileage examples. So if you sit on a Vespa that you're going to buy, whether it's a small frame or a large frame, chances are the higher mileage ones are going to be on large frames. Um, what you're going to find is that the handlebars may be loose, and if they are, um, just be aware that that's a higher mileage bike. Um, the more I uh, learn about these Vespas and the culture around them is it just it actually kind of makes me more and more nervous uh, as I move forward with this thing but I mean they're terrific bikes they really are 
they're just uh, they're dead simple, especially the old small frames. They're dead simple, and they are they're just a uh, they invoke emotions in people because of the styling and what it what it represents, especially to Italians. The Vespas I'm, I'm learning are are just deeply loved by by Italians for what it represents, and that is the um, resurrection of Italy's economy following World War II. Um, you know, these were created out of a need. They created jobs, and um, and the usage of the Vespas in movies and uh, and in film or in, you know in in, in, uh, in entertainment and um, in print advertisements and it just they're used in so many aspects of Italian culture. I mean, you look at a Vespa, you immediately think Italy, and um, it, it, it's like they represent Italian pride, if you will, um, because of uh, you know because of their heritage and and what they meant following World War II in Italy. Um, it's kind of like the American Harley Davidson, you know. Americans love Harley Davidson. Most Americans, many Americans, love Harley Davidsons because of what they represent. They represent, um, you know, post. Well, they were more successful around World War II uh, because GIs were taking home military bikes and uh, you know turning them into, you know, their own custom bikes, but. The Harley Davidson represents the open road. It represents freedom. It represents American pride, just as the Vespa represents, you know, the Italian economy resurfacing or regenerating itself following World War II. And uh, I'm trying to keep that in mind in my restoration. I don't want to change anything. I don't want to. I don't want to change the color. I don't want to change the tires. I don't want to change the wheels. I want it to look like it did when it rolled off the assembly line, as close to that as humanly possible, um, within reason. Um, so when I go to repaint the bike, it's not getting a clear coat finish. It's getting a single stage red paint job, and I've already uh, I'm already actively looking at different companies and paint shops around here to see what they can do for my money. Now, they also don't want to go broke doing this. It's going to cost me a fortune um, to do it right, and I know that. Um, <clears throat> but it's definitely a project that I, I want to put a lot of pride into. I want to. I don't want to cut any corners. When I order parts for this, I'm going to spring for the better quality parts. I'm going to go with a genuine Piaggio muffler. Actually, no, I'm not. I found a, another manufacturer that's just as good. Um, but half the price. <laughs> um, so the exhaust system is getting replaced with a good quality uh, uh, reproduction. Um, but you know, there are a lot of parts that I'm, I'm going to try to stick with the original. One thing I can't figure out is whether this originally had f uh, Pirelli's or what was the other tire that I found? It's got um, it's got a Pirelli and a Michelin tire. And I think it originally shipped with Pirelli's, not Michelin's. Um, let's take a look at those. Actually, I'm going to drag them out because now that I have it, now that, we're, now that I'm discussing it, I want to kind of go over what I just noticed here. One of the tires is actually original to the bike. There they are. So these are the wheels. These are the original wheels. And I think... This tire right here is one of the originals. This would be um, this would have likely been on the front, but this is a Pirelli tire. It says so right on it. Um, I couldn't figure out the date code on it because I don't think they used standardized date codes back then. But if I'm right, um, where did I see it? I don't think I I don't think it had a date code on it. Um, the Michelin has a date code of like 1970. Um, the Michelin is a tire that is technically still good. It still has good tread on it, um, but it's dry rotted to all hell. So, um, yeah, I can't really make out a date code on this, 
but it's an Italian tire made in Italy and uh, it's oily as hell so at one point this wheel was likely on the rear um, unless they, they may have rotated the tires at some point uh, it's still got some of the original paint on it um, but it's going to be repainted I'm going to actually use a rattle can for that but it's going to be repainted silver I toyed with the idea of having it powder coated in gray but I chose not to do that because it's just not original enough. So, the Vespas use uh, the same tire front and rear, unlike most modern scooters and motorcycles. But this one is a Michelin. It's been replaced. And, uh, let's see. I think I found a date code on this one. Where did I find it? Sorry, my stomach is making noises. All right, it was 69, 69. So if this is in fact, now this is telling, it's very telling as to how the scooter was written and when it was written. If, now uh, the mileage I believe is correct, it was um, what, 6,300 miles? If that is correct, then that tells me that oh, this is also made in Italy. I thought Michelin tires were made in France. I, I guess not. But what that really tells me is that most of the miles are put on very early on in the bike's life. It probably hasn't been on the road on a regular basis since the 1970s. These are the little details that kind of help shape the history or help bring it to life, you know, the history of a vehicle. When you look at the tires that are on it, you know, this one obviously was on the rear because the rear has all the oil and grease in it from the engine. That makes sense. So it's likely that this tire originally went on the front. Sometime in the early 1970s, the rear tire wore out. The rear tire is always the first one to go. So, they moved the front tire to the rear, and they put a brand new Michelin on the front. If the date code is correct, if I'm reading it right, if it is a date code, um, then that would mean that in, like, 1970, the tires are swapped around. Now, you look at the tire from 1970, and it has perfect tread on it. It's, um, it's actually in quite good condition. Very low miles on this tire. Um, it all kind of fits together. It makes perfect sense. And that would explain the low miles. Um, 6,300 miles is a lot of miles for one of these. Oh, well, maybe not really. Not really. No, it's not a lot. Uh, it's, it's just enough miles to where it's about ready for its first engine rebuild. Remember, these two-stroke engines are... Um, they're high maintenance, so, <laughs> you know, um, they, they do require a lot of maintenance when it comes to, uh, you know, the upper end, um, you know, they do require, you know, regular rebuilds, like, at least every, you know, 10,000 miles or so. Unlike a four-stroke, a two-stroke is basically working its guts out every time it runs. You know, they're, they're a high-stress engine. They're a very high-powered, lightweight engine, but, you know, they're very stressed out in, uh, when they're being used. Um, so they do require a lot of maintenance to live a long life. Now this fender, it has to be replaced. I'm not going to spend the money to have a body shop fix it because um, that's what it's going to take. I'd have to have a body shop actually repair this fender, and that's not, it's just not going to happen. <laughs> it's got a hole cut into it because somebody tried to use a cutting torch to remove a bolt. Yeah, I cried when I saw that. This is the original fender, and look at the condition it's in. I mean, it's totally salvageable. 
but to pay someone to do the body work on it just isn't worth it to me. Um, I can get a brand new fender for less than the cost of, a, of fixing the old one. And uh, that's a good quality replacement. Now there, there are low quality replacements and there are high quality. I'm going with a, a much higher quality than, um, than the cheapest option. So, But um, once I bring it to the body shop, <laughs> I'm at their mercy. All the body work is going to be in the uh, the main chassis and specifically removing that massive dent. So um, if you want to see more on that, I encourage you to watch some of my other videos. But for now, we're going to call it a day. And uh, Oh, i got to put this back in there too. Brand new speedometer. The engine work is going to happen later on in the restoration project. See, the engine I'm not that worried about. I looked at the engine over. I looked the engine over, and I saw that there really isn't any noticeable wear and tear on it. But despite all that, I have to split the case to uh, replace, um, of course, all the seals, the uh, gear shift cruciform, and uh, I'm going to put in a set of bearings while I'm in there. Um, I'm not going to bother with a new piston. I'm just going to re-hone the cylinder. It's going to keep the original rings, and I'm going to run it that way as long as I can. And once it starts to, you know, lose power or show any signs of needing a rebuild, then I'll do the top end. Um, but I'm going to make sure that I have a first oversized piston and rings on hand before all that. Actually, what I'm going to do is I'm going to swap out the crank and the piston at the same time. That way, I am actually upgrading the piston, um, or sorry, the wrist pin bearing from a sleeve to a roller bearing. Uh, that design change was made, I believe, in the 1965 model year. So I'm going to be upgrading the engine just a, just a bit. Um, Vespa made that change. So the piston, the rings, and the, and the crank kind of have to be replaced as an entire package. There's a lot of other reasons why that is. I'll go into it, and if you really want me to, okay, I'll go into it. So, for whatever reason, Vespa used, after 1964, they used, um, they changed the crank, or the, the wrist pin, to a, um, I believe it's a smaller diameter with a roller bearing. So that means the piston and the, uh, the connecting rod have to be replaced together because you can't really buy it's a really complicated <laughs> the piston rings were, were actually narrowed so they're thinner now they're thinner after 64 so I can't buy rings for an original 64 piston they're on their own unobtainium so if I have to re-ring the engine I have to replace the piston if I'm gonna replace the piston I might as well replace the crank and just go with a newer style piston with modern ring, de uh, modern, um, ring design, thin or thinner rings, and a more modern uh, small end <laughs> bearing, which is going to be a roller bearing. It's just a whole big complicated mess because it's a 64 engine. Now, if I wanted to replace the jug, my only option is to actually have the case bored out for a larger jug because they changed the jug mouth size to a larger size. It's just a disaster. So, uh, <laughs> that's why once I get it going, it's going to be used very seldomly. I'm just going to keep it running, you know, run it every once in a while just to keep it going. Take it to car shows, but it's not going to be a daily driver. It's going to be a show bike and nothing more. Um, because I don't want to get into having to do machine work on the block. One other option, of course, is to replace the entire engine with a later model engine. I, I'm keeping my options open, but I want to keep it a numbers matching bike if that even is a thing in the Vespa community. I don't think it is, but hey, I want to keep it original as much as possible not my daily driver. That's what the Helix is for. The Helix gets all the abuse and all the miles because that's what it was built to do. 
The Vespa is like that little old lady. You don't want to stress her out too much. You don't want to bring her to Disney World and throw her on a roller coaster, although it might be fun. Um, it might also kill her in the process. And I don't want to kill the old lady, you know what I'm saying? She's fragile. She's a delicate little engine, delicate little bike. Antique, worth a little bit of money. Properly restored, I'm thinking three grand plus. I'm hoping four. But as time goes on, the value may, may improve. The value may increase. And that's what I'm kind of hoping. Now I'm just having fun. I'm watching my froggies eat, and that's all the fun I need. Hey. Hey. I thought you were hungry. Hmm? Come on. Eat. No, huh? You're not hungry? You're just scoping things out. Uh, the food's over there. Watch this. I'll tease him. Oh, wait. Here's... <laughs> you saw that. They're very, very interested in motion. They like to see things move. I think it's a, a natural reflex to... Um, cause they're used to eating live creatures. Little insects and bugs and stuff. Brine shrimp. Mmm. Watch this. They think my finger. He, he thinks my finger's food. She actually it's a she. Mine eat my finger. Eat my finger. No, huh? Not hungry. Okay. Fine. <laughs> 